Welcome to our Big Think Big series brought to you by PSG. My name is Leon Taylor and I'm PSG's Head of Group Legal and Compliance. As a leading financial services group, PSG has an extensive national footprint in South Africa and a presence in Namibia. We've been in operation since 1998 and pride ourselves on providing a bigger picture approach to our clients' financial needs, from asset management and wealth management to short-term insurance. We are an advanced-led business backed by some of the best financial advisors around the country. The Think Big series is a collection of dialogues with high-value value speakers hosted by award-winning financial journalist Bruce Whitfield. Each topic will address burning questions which are causing South Africans anxiety in these uncertain times. The series aims to empower our audiences with factual evidence to formulate their own opinions and manage their expectations on how various aspects of the current situation could unfold. In today's webinar, Bruce talks to Professor Tuli Madoncella, who has been a lifelong activist on social justice, constitutionalism, human rights, good governance, and the rule of law. I also know she is a huge supporter of the Makatsi principle, a principle embedded in the Vavenda culture where an elderly woman holds to account the leadership on behalf of the followers or the family members. Pretty much the same that's being done or should be done by the Section 9 institutions under the Constitution in South Africa, where the body should be holding accountable the leadership on behalf of its citizens. She recently completed a seven-year term as South Africa's public protector and is now the Law Trust Chair in Social Justice and Law Professor at the University of Stellenbosch. Tuli has an exceptional list of accolades, named one of Time 100's most influential people in the world, co-founder and one of the leaders of the South African Women Lawyers Association. Tuli is one of the drafters of South Africa's constitution and co-architect of several laws that have sought to anchor South Africa's democracy. Amongst the laws she helped draft are the Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act, the Employment Equity Act, and the Recognition of Customary, Customary Managers Act. Her work has received national and global recognition, including several Lifetime Achievement Awards. Our campaign social media hashtag is hashtag ThinkBigPSG. This series is free, shareable, and open to anyone interested, whether or not you're a client. Bruce, of course, has little or needs little introduction. Bruce, it's over to you. Leon, thank you very much indeed. Welcome, everybody, to the Think Big series with PSG. It's a great privilege today to have Tuli Madunsela, former public protector, um, with us to talk about social justice, to talk about the state of play in terms of South Africa's legal system, the frustratingly slow process of justice in our country, and she'll give us some really valuable insights today on that. Tuli Madunsela, really good to have you with us today. I wonder whether you miss the, the hurly-burly, the cut and thrust, the, the, the the left hooks and the right hooks of the Office of Public Protector, which you've been out of now probably for nearly two years. Hi, Bruce. Sometimes I do miss the ability to make a difference with the authority to do so. Sometimes I don't. I like the idea of life being about climbing different mountains. And when you finish with one, you start at the bottom of another. So many South Africans are so deeply frustrated by the glacial pace of, of, of justice in South Africa. We've in recent months um, seen finally some charge sheets come out uh, and uh, the, those accused of the great BBS bank heist appear in court. Um, and it's, this is a case that will drag on as traditionally is the case for, for months and years ahead. But it's the first in a series, what we hope will be a series, of judicial breakthroughs in South Africa. Why does it take so long to get justice in our country? It takes very long to get justice in South Africa because of capacity, particularly capacity in terms of numbers. But when it comes to matters of corruption, you will recall, Bruce, that during state capture, institutions were hollowed out. Good people who were doing their job with dedication were removed. 
and uh, people who had no clue but were ready to protect certain individuals were given high profile jobs. And people like Shamila Patohi in the NPA have had to rebuild uh, the institutions. And I do know people feel that the NPA should have acted faster. What I learned as public protector was it's better not to deal with a case than to deal with it and lose it. Because you then give the wrongdoer the authority to brag that I've been investigated and I was found not guilty. Take me back to, I mean, you were doing something like 25,000 cases a year as public protector, yet we know of a, a tiny handful, the ones that grabbed public attention. The role of public protector had not really been fully exploited, if you like, up until you took that role. You took a, a very different emphasis, though. You took on fights that many before you might have balked at, and many, and, and you know, since you've left, others have, have perhaps not being as thorough uh, and, as, and as precise as you were in the, the targeting of cases that you took on. What made you take on Jacob Zuma in the way that you did? Well, the reason I took on the case was really part of ensuring an accountable state. It was also my commitment to social justice and the rule of law. As a team in the Park Protector Office, we always see it that no case is too small for our attention and our formula, and no case is too big. And in every case, we use the same formula. What happened? What should have happened? Is there a discrepancy between what happened and what should have happened? And if there's a discrepancy, is it one that is explainable? If it can't, does it constitute impropriety? And if it does, how do we make sure that we fix the situation? And of course, if the people have been wronged or a person has been wronged, how do we place them as close as possible to where they would have been if the impropriety had not happened? And President Zuma's case was not different from the case of a Gogo Zamini whose pension has been stopped uh, arbitrarily or a, a Gogo Zamini whose municipal bill is exorbitant and nobody's going to listen to them, or a landowner whose land has been appropriated, expropriated by a municipality without compensation, without consultation. We dealt with all of these cases with exactly the same dedication. Yet you were recognized and acknowledged as a person who possibly single-handed, and I'd like your view on that, helped to bring an end to state capture without the work that you and your team at the Public Protector's Office did in those very, very dark and difficult years, we may never have got to a point where we actually understood what had happened at Nkanda. And Nkanda was the tip, as we know, of a, a huge iceberg. Um, but that commitment set about unraveling a deeply corrupt and unjust state. Do you take credit for it? Well, I, I'm grateful that people think my team and I contributed something, Bruce. I don't take credit for single-handedly hand, hand, handling state capture. I think that it was really a, a, a connection of several lights. The media broke the story. And the journalists that dealt with it were very persistent with the story until somebody took this matter to my office. I think three uh, different complainants lodged this complaint with my office. And the team at the Pop Protector office was marvelous in, in, uh, in coming to the party because this matter came to us when I was wrapping up and my focus was on fixing what we already had in our plate and we didn't want to take new cases. But my team felt that nobody else was prepared to deal with this matter. It had gone to parliament, it had, then, it had gone to the governing party, and nobody was handling it. And of course, the power protector, like the Makati, is the ultimate buffer between a delinquent state and, and the people. And uh, if the power protector doesn't step in, the fabric of society might not hold.
Explain that Makatsi principle to me, please. Leon did introduce you and say that you are a believer in the Makatsi principle of, and I mean, he, he said it's usually the old woman, and I, 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 would, I wouldn't blame you for taking offense to that. Um, but it is somebody senior and respected um, who stands up and says this far and no further, holds to account people who see themselves as unaccountable. Well, firstly, thank you, Leon, for remembering the principle of the Makati as really the symbol of the public director. It is a, a traditional arrangement within the Venda community where they had an aunt who would be the advisor to the king. This aunt would be the eyes and ears of the king and the voice of the people. And... It is said that a wise king would always listen to the Makazi and the foolish one would ignore her at his peril. Most traditional societies have something similar to the Makazi. Among the closer you have Umafungwase, which is the oldest princess among the Swazi, among the Zulu. And we, the research was done by the Bermuda public protector ombudsman. And this is where I found this idea of um, understanding that although the ombudsman is imported from Sweden, there are similar institutions in this continent that can be equated with the pop protector. And here's the deal. This is how the pop protector um, uh, survived, by adopting the Makati. We never saw ourselves as being at war with the state. We saw ourselves as being the second eye where there's been a blind spot, pick it up, let them correct it. Because for me, it was important that the state never feels that it is at a stage where uh, I am seen as out to get them. And therefore, whatever I say, they had a right to ignore it because that would have been to the detriment of the Gogota Minis. If every case was taken on review, my effectiveness would not have held. Do you think your successor has followed the principle of the Makats? It really is not my place to judge. I, I think every public protector um, deals with this position the best way they, they know how. I had my own way. I, I learned from Selby Bagwa and Mr. Mushwane, and I built on what they had done. I introduced face-to-face -face mediation and conciliation. I introduced the taking the pop protector to the people. And uh, I introduced one-to-one -one meetings with ministers and with political parties to make sure that we don't just scream at each other through the newspapers. We also see it at their offices to just talk about what's the deal? What is the problem? We have a country to be run. We have a people to be served. Can we all get our ducks in the row? Do you, I mean, again, and I know this is an uncomfortable place for you to be, but I'm curious and I need to prod a little bit. Does Busisiwa Mkobane built on your legacy in the same way as you built on the legacy of your predecessors, do you think? She would be the person to answer that question, <laughs> Bruce. It's think, not my place have, to answer that question. That is question. the answer. Uh, that, uh, I suspect that that answer uh, tells us all we need to know about it. Let's move on. So what's your take on the Zondo Commission? It is... Uh, I don't know, it's like I'm, I'm peeling an onion, if you like, the deeper and deeper you get into the onion, the more you cry, or maybe it's a, a Russian doll effect, every time you take the lid off the doll, there's another one inside, and it's the seemingly impossible task of dealing with the huge volume of corruption in our country, and it's an almost endless battle that they are engaged in. I like the Russian doll analogy for the Zonda Commission, because that's exactly how it has operated. Just as you say, uh, as you kill one doll, you find another inside. That's exactly what has happened. I think the commission has done a sterling job in awakening social accountability. And social accountability is direct accountability between public representatives and the people. I think people understand a little bit more about how the state operates, uh, the right and wrong, of state operations. 
if there may be something that I am a little bit uncomfortable about the commission, uh, there are two things. It's the enormity of the amount of money the commission has used. Never in my wildest dreams did I think this commission could take this much because we had worked it out and we knew how we could have done it had we had the time to do it. The second thing, uh, uh, in addition to the amount of money, it's the amount of time. Because the longer it takes to solve a crime, and because corruption is a crime and state capture is corruption, the longer it takes to solve a crime, the colder the case becomes. And solving a cold case is extremely difficult because the clues are gone, the evidence has been shredded, etc. But also, money recovery is very difficult. Having said all of this, from Stellenbosch University, we, will, we are now uh, going to be offering a course on investigations. How do you choreograph investigations to avoid a very um, disorganized way of sequencing your evidence, to have your evidence properly sequenced? And, uh, and how do you uh, do your forensics right at the beginning so that you can prevent people giving you the ring dance? Are you suggesting that the Zondo Commission has not been effectively managed? I mean, that seems to be your assertion. It's gone over time and over budget, which anybody who's ever done a building project at home knows is the deep frustration of doing a building project. And I imagine something as big and complex and as unwieldy as state corruption um, is the same on a far larger scale. I am not suggesting it's, it's improperly managed. I am suggesting that knowing what we know now, we will be helping those who are likely to be uh, asked upon to investigate, to, uh, to go through a course. Investigations is the only important field in life I know where you can just be an investigator without having ever uh, undertaken an investigation course. And in my early life as public protector, I attended three extremely important investigation courses. One was Sharpen the Teeth, which I attended in Canada. And it was very important that I was taught right at the beginning, I think I was about three months into office, about how to sequence your case. And and how to sequence your witnesses and how to control the crime scene if it's a corruption matter, etc. All I'm saying is just in future, we would like to train lawyers who want to be involved in investigations to, uh, to have these extra teeth of investigations because being a lawyer is different from being an investigator. Being an investigator is an active job. It's more a job of a policeman but a different kind of policy. Will we ever see justice, do you think, when it comes to the large scale corruption that we have seen? I mean, there is so much evidence which is in the public domain, whether that evidence is solid enough to secure a conviction in a court of law, I don't know. What is your assessment? Justice, we will see, absolutely. But Social I justice so or justice in the form of handcuffs and yellow orange overalls? I mean, um, because there are multiple layers of justice, of course. Um, people can be embarrassed, they can be humiliated, they can have a bad name. But will we see people go to jail for state corruption? We'll definitely see people go to jail. Will it be all of them? I'm not sure. I do think, though, going forward, and I know people are not going to like what I'm about to say, we have to think about different ways of justice. The way Madela and them thought about a different way of justice, and hence they came up with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Imagine if the State Capture Commission had been structured in such a way that uh, there was a self-disclosure process and an investigation process. And the self-disclosure process guaranteed you that you won't wear those orange overalls, but there was some kind of payback to society that would be expected of you. I think we would be getting more people telling us what exactly happened, and I think we would be moving faster. It's just a 
my suggestion that we have to think a little bit differently about justice. And again, that brings me to borrowing from traditional societies. Traditional societies functioned effectively. They had no jails, at least not in this continent, they had no jails, but they still made sure that there was justice and that everyone knew their place. Um, would it be too late to change the terms of reference of the Zondo Commission to say, all right, let's revisit this thing. It's costing too much money. I mean, 356 million by September last right. year, a budget request this year for 250 million rand. It's vast amounts of money that we don't have as a country. Could we change the terms of reference or alter the terms of reference? Or does that undermine the integrity of a, a really critical process? I think changing the terms of reference would be seen as interference. We just have to, to bear into this way and look at lessons because we will need commissions of inquiry going forward. And the idea of the commission of inquiry was that it was supposed to be cheaper and faster and it has been the opposite. And we have to look at it and say, honestly, honestly, what went well and what didn't go right. But one thing for certain, this commission has done an excellent job in terms of excavating and, and, and revealing a whole lot of things that would, then, would never have known had we dealt with this matter as an ordinary investigation. And I think we've also got to remember in the context, and you were talking about the evisceration of structures and systems and processes and institutions uh, being hollowed out. I mean, the destruction of the scorpions at Polokwane, um, and then the hawks came out, but the you know, mismanagement there and issues of leadership there and corruption within the ranks of the hawks have meant that it also has not been a, a solid a police service as it could have been, and the destruction of the National Prosecuting Authority, and still the huge lack of trust that Shamila Batoy must have in some of the people that still uh, you know, exist within the corridors of the National Prosecuting Authority. With all that dysfunction, perhaps the Zondo Commission is the best of a, a, a series of bad options, perhaps, that we had at our disposal. I think it is a, a, a great option. I agree with you, Bruce. Uh, partly, even if Ms. Batohi trusted her colleagues, the truth is that criminals operate as a syndicate, as a syndicate. Even if she trusted those people, they're so tentacles of the people who left the system that remain within the system. And it's a process to try and clean out the system. The Commission, on the other hand, I think one of the greatest advantages of it is that it is bringing justice back to the people. Because, yes, not many people are watching the Zonda Commission these days, but if you consider the courts versus the Commission, far more people are watching the Commission than they watch court processes. And that's a victory because for democracy to hold, people must stay engaged. Do you think that there is any significant level of real embarrassment? I mean, you know, in, uh, often you see people uh, dying of shame once they've been exposed as being fraudsters and crooks. And we've got so many in South Africa um, that it's almost become a national sport. You know, if we hadn't won a rugby World Cup, we might win a corruption World Cup, not to undermine the great success, of course, of South Africa's sporting heroes. But it just feels like we have become so ambivalent about critical issues in South Africa, whether that be road deaths or murder rates or gender-based violence or um, inequality or corruption, for goodness sake. So many things have become so normalized in society that they kind of wash over us and we're just exhausted by it all. It is true that there has been a point that we reached where it seemed like South Africans tolerate crime. I don't think we tolerate corruption anymore. I think people have seen how corruption steals resources away from them. And I can see this on the Twitter streets that people, um, they might be fatigued by the extent of corruption, but no, they're not 
prepared to take it lying down. When it comes to the rule of law generally, I, my barometer is uh, dealing with young people uh, under the social justice mm -hmm. chair at Stellenbosch University and the Tuma Foundation. I'm finding that generation, um, generation Z and the millennials are truly concerned about building a functional society. I also see this at One Young World. It might not be so visible out there, but I think a quiet revolution of uprightness is brewing just quietly somewhere. And those who think that they can rely on young people to support them when they're corrupt, I think it's going to be time up very soon. I mean, I'm encouraged, and I think we all see the subtext of where you're going there. I'm not going to prod you on that particular point, but I think it's a point well made. Again, give me a sense, please, of our health as a society. Um, yes, there's huge inspiration amongst young people who are fed up with the abuses and the violence and the crime and the corruption and the lack of decency um, among segments of society. But we've got some fundamental issues in South Africa. I mean, so much has come to the fore and so regularly comes to the fore and it comes in waves and then disappears into the midst and then another child is abused or murdered and we get a, a burst of news around gender-based violence or abuse of children. As a society, uh, we're, we're sick as a society. I don't think that is stretching it too far. I mean, gender-based violence, the social justice element of the work that you're doing at Selenbosch now, is so much more pertinent than it's ever been. It's true. And you say we're a sick society. Others say we're a broken society. And I think that's a good starting point, acknowledging our brokenness. And part of the problem is that when we achieved our great democracy and we became a model for the whole world, we put ourselves under so much pressure to represent to the world that all had been healed and everything was great. We didn't deal with the cracks. We didn't deal with the healing the divisions of, of the past. And we didn't deal with the, the corruption cracks that were already there in the system. And, and because of that, the past is coming back to haunt us, or rather the shadow of the past is forever rearing its ugly head and disrupting us. Maybe it's a good thing that it is disrupting us because it's, it's forcing us to confront it. But I don't want to suggest that every ill in our society is because of the past. I just think that the challenges of corruption, the, challenge, the challenges of not moving fast enough to make sure that everyone has decent work, everyone has uh, some form of income or some form of, of access to wealth, access to a home, and just general well-being has created this kind of dysfunctionality in society. We see it come forward in so many different ways. I mean, the Black Lives Matter movement um, is, is taken center stage once again, George Floyd's killing by police in the United States. Um, the eight, nine minutes of a policeman's knee on a young man's neck as he begs for his mother and shouts that he can't breathe becomes this global symbol of, uh, of injustice and inequality. And uh, this issue of Black Lives Matter becomes a massive global social justice issue because from the days of, I mean, long before Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther King, I suppose, was the first of the Black Lives Matter movement of the modern era, if you like. Um, and then you go through the, the killing of Rodney King, for example, and then George Floyd. And in South Africa, so many examples of poor people just continuing to be abused by systems that they can't seem to navigate or confront or challenge or, or develop within. Um, and it's a, it's a global appeal for help. It is. Again, Judge Floyd's murder is part of the shadow of the past. 
that the laws that oppressed and excluded people on the basis of race were removed. But the attitude, uh, the attitudes that told people that some are more equal than others were never confronted. And when you have been told that you're more equal than others, you see that is your privilege. And when those you believe are not equal to you seem to be threatening that privilege, you step up to protect the privilege. It's the same problem with gender-based violence. We've told women that you're equal to men. We've changed laws to make sure that there's gender equality. But how much have we done in changing the male psyche to say you don't have to put yourself under pressure to be the breadwinner, to be in charge, to be in control? A lot of points. How do we overcome yeah. this in South Africa? I mean, we've got the global examples. We love to sort of push it out and out there and say, oh, a global issue. Oh, yes, George Floyd, it's terrible. Look at the brutality of the police. But we've got so many examples in South Africa of precisely this phenomenon playing out in a country that should be different, and it's not. Stop relying only on the justice system. Law is an important instrument of change, but it has its own shortcomings. And under the Mandela government, we had a national crime prevention strategy. It was a strategy. You and me as members of society knew what is that strategy. If it was 10 points, we knew it was 10 points. We knew what was the role of the police, what was the role of justice, what was the role of social development, and what is the role of town planning, and what was my role. Currently, there's too much emphasis on the police. You can't police people who are struggling with their mental wellness. In fact, I came across a statistic recently that was saying that the majority of people who commit domestic violence are not thinking about the severity of the crime when they do this. No, it wasn't about domestic violence, actually. It was about the death penalty. We were dealing with the death penalty. That in countries where there is a death penalty, when people kill, they're not thinking about whether I'm going to go to the gallows or not. So you've got to deal, you, you've got, of course, to have a justice system that is very good at catching criminals, processing them, and sending them where they belong. But you also have to invest very heavily in prevention. You also have to, as part of investing very heavily in prevention, you need to teach humans to be humans. I don't think we're doing enough to teach children how to be humans, especially those who don't grow up with parents, those who are growing up with their parents leaving at 3 a.m. to go to work and coming at 9 at night sent to schools, there is life orientation that teaches them a, a little bit. But one of my students now uh, in, in, in the first semester in, in our legal skills did education on human rights. Her finding was showing that when children are educated very seriously on human rights, two things happen. One, there's greater respect for the rights of others, but two, there's greater respect for themselves. They found that in parts of England, when this was done, the performance of these students, just in their, their grades improved because suddenly by understanding human rights, they started to value themselves as human beings before they valued other people. They started to treat themselves better and performing well at school. And they also started treating each other well and there was less bullying. So, one of the things we need to do is invest in society, in, in teaching people on how to be Abantu. It's called Ubuntu. What does it mean to be an Ubuntu? In, in, in the elephant kingdom, they train an elephant to be an elephant. It's not enough to train an elephant on how to fight uh, invasions of the tribe and how to find food. They also 
trained on how to be a functional member of the community. Same thing happens among monkeys and other social animals. We have to train our children and on how to be functional members of our society. It's so easy to lose hope. It is so easy to be despondent, particularly with the quadruple whammy that we've had in South Africa of, you know, no sooner are we coming to terms with the past and no sooner are we dealing with the evils of corruption um, and then we're dealing with the masses of, of inequality and COVID-19 comes along and bats us into another corner. Um, and South Africa right now is, a, I think the world is a despondent place, but South Africa particularly despondent with 3 million people through COVID-19 losing their jobs. Inequality is rising. Hunger is rising. The very basic needs of humanity are not being um, serviced at this particular time. And it's incredibly hard to not be despondent. What gives you optimism in the future? Well, if you lose hope, you lose everything. I am always hopeful. I always see my class is half full. And what gives me hope, though, is the young people in this country. I am seeing change. The other day I was at Wurz University as a guest of young people that had organized this round table, virtual round table on punishment, crime and punishment. What is the best way to imprison people? Should we do it the Norwegian way, where it's like a hotel and we treat it uh, uh, courteously? Or should we keep our way? And the way uh, they were talking. I see young people under the Tuma Foundation who are concerned about making democracy work. I see young people involved in, uh, in, in social justice work at Stonebush University. I see young people in all platforms. One Young World is actually the best platform that tells me that this country um, is onto something big, that the future is much brighter than we think. Our companies are the brightest lights in the world and there's leadership there. So that's another source of hope. If you can combine the leadership that is emerging among young people, the leadership in companies, and the great humanity within government, because yes, there's a lot of people who, who drop the ball in government, but trust me, Bruce, the majority of people in government are both competent and good people. It's just often they are displaced. So I, I, I do see light at the end of the tunnel. And yes, there are also people who don't think much of the president now because of COVID-19. But I do think that he is social literate, he's business literate, and I do think that somehow he will help us turn the corner. I honestly do. Tuli Marantzela, thank you so much for your time, uh, for joining us on the Think Big series with PSG. Leon, back to you. Thank you, Bruce and Tuli, for your independent and honest insights. I must say that was one of the more enlightening discussions I have heard in a while, especially relating to gender-based violence and, of course, the issue of hopeful. Let us be hopeful in, 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 in what we want to achieve in this specific country going forward. Tuli, of course, has a global reputation for integrity and fearlessness in enforcing accountability and justice in the exercise of public power and the use of public resources. She also has a history of highlighting the importance of social justice, as we could have seen now, and general inclusive enjoyment of the fruits of democracy in a pursuit of peace. That came out in her conversation with us now, and I hope we take heart in what she said and how the way that she presented herself and this country as a whole. In this webinar, Professor Marancella showed beyond a doubt that South Africans cannot live up to its promise until the rule of law is firmly established and entrenched in this country. But having said that, I think one needs to take cognizance and show empathy and sympathy towards law enforcement agencies and prosecutors in dealing with cases when it comes to multi-jurisdictional crime criminality and activities relating to crime. Those investigations does take time. You have to engage with other jurisdictions. 
and it's not easy to get information from those specific from those specific entities and or jurisdictions and of course most of all justice must be seen to be done but unfortunately our clients are exposed to this uh, noise as well and this creates uncertainty uncertainty about investment decisions when to act when to invest and how to plan for the future all in all, making decisions has become much more difficult. Just as many politicians are driven by fear and greed, so are many investors. South Africans typically work hard for their money, but emotions can blur objective decision-making about your portfolios. This takes me to the value of good, untainted, and objective financial advice. PSG has the best network of financial advisors, both wealth and insure. A network that has been built Built up over many years. Through the expertise, our financial advisors add a layer of certainty to your decision making. If you already have a PSG advisor, I encourage you to engage with them. They are well equipped to advise on your financial and insurance portfolio, be it offshore, be it local. And if you don't, then please get in touch with us via this event's registration platform. We welcome your feedback as usual. Please communicate with us. The next speakers in the series are Bronwyn William on the topic Future of the Entrepreneur, Professor Glenda Gray on the topic Future of Medical Regulation and of course Enforcement, and Dr. Leila Faree on the topic Future of Local and Global Financial Markets. From my side, thank you for joining. Stay safe. Most important, as Tully said, be hopeful and see you later. Goodbye.